Hello everyone. We are really excited to be here, at least virtually, and to talk to you about this very uh, interesting individual, the Blair at Man. My name is Orsha Yatsira, or Orshi, for simplicity's sake, and I am a teaching fellow and research fellow at the University of Aberdeen, along with Dr. Kate Britton, reader and head of Department of Archaeology at Aberdeen, we will discuss what we can learn about uh, this early medieval individual and uh, we will gain some insights into ongoing developments from Mark Hall, from Perth Museum and Art Gallery as well. In 1985, a long kissed grave with possible cairn capping was discovered during domestic construction works at Bridge of Tilt which is a village that is continuous with the settlement of Blair Atoll. The burial was subsequently excavated by Alison Reed, who was the curator of archaeology at Perth Museum and Art Gallery at the time. The remains are currently held at Perth Museum and Art Gallery and have since been radiocarbon dated to the 5th, 6th century AD. This individual is now known to the public as the Blair Atoll man. The grave itself was east to west oriented and only half a meter below the surface there were 20 stones in at least four covering layers that were observed during the excavation. This seems to indicate a possibility that the long kist was originally overlain by a cairn monument. The kist itself was, bu was built front and slabs which were made of locally available mica schist. Although there were no grave goods found with the burial, the foot end of the kist was closed off with a vertically placed thickened round flat pad of stone, uh, which was suggested to be a so-called pseudocairn stone. These are relatively common finds at archaeological sites in late uh, Iron Age, early medieval Scotland, but the incorporation of such a domestic agricultural stone implement has been documented in only a small number of mid-first millennium AD burials, such as those from Laswade in the Mid Lothian, Campton in East Lothian, London links from Fife, and there is also Pitlockery in Persia. The careful selection of materials was an important element in the construction of long kists, and such elements may have had a symbolic aspect, which could have formed part of the funerary event with a wider social and political meaning. Although longest burials are known from Iron Age Scotland, this practice only reached the peak of its popularity in the 5th, 7th centuries AD, with singular graves dominating the burial landscape of medieval Scotland. The skeleton itself demonstrated good preservation and was later identified to be that of a male of around 45 years of age. Now, this can actually be considered relatively elderly for its time. He was a tall individual at 1.78 meters or 5 foot 10 inches. Uh, while the analysis of skeletal morphology identified evidence of pronounced muscle attachments, which indicates a, physical ac a physically active lifestyle. There was no evidence of trauma on his skeletal remains, although molar abscess has been suggested as a potential cause of death due to possible septicemia. Although this was a singular burial, we know from the archaeological evidence that there were similar burials in the area, and that the majority of early medieval cemeteries in Fife and Tayside contain small populations, generally consisting of fewer than six burials. There is even a historically documented short case cemetery along the, bank, along the bank of the River Tilt. We cannot at this time exclude the possibility, therefore, that this was part of a smaller group of burials completely. This area of Persia, in fact, can boast a rich burial landscape stretching from the Bronze Age onwards. There's descriptions of a cemetery stating that coffins composed of five flags and their contents are eroding into the tilt, named as Kilandreas. Um, this can be found in the old statistical account of Scotland. A large druidical cairn is also described as being located to the south of Kilandreas, possibly representing a monumental burial between the short East cemetery and a long case of Blair at Man. There is archaeological evidence for human activity here beyond the presence of burials in the local area from the late Iron Age through to the early medieval period and beyond. Twin ring forts are located at Altclun, for example. These lie just over two kilometers southeast from the site, 
with a broad chronology encompassing the Iron Age, Roman Iron Age, uh, with evidence of possible early medieval reuse. There is also a Neolithic Bronze Age Copmarch stone that was incorporated into the boundary wall at Altklun, and evidence of reuse of such prehistoric material was found at Borenich 3 as well, just six kilometers to the south. A variety of sites demonstrate the long history of human habitation in the region. Iron Age homesteads have been excavated approximately 13 kilometers to the southeast at Pit Lockery as well, uh, and further to the south around Loch Tunnel, along with Iron Age and Pictish structures, enclosures, and other buildings as part of the multi period archaeological landscape at Bundranok, further still around 25 kilometers to the southwest. So you must consider this individual in focus as part of this populated archaeological landscape. Thanks to local interest in the burial, as well as the various advancements in archaeological approaches, these remains found over 30 years ago are being re-evaluated today as part of a community and commercial effort. Along with the museum, various university researchers, including ourselves, have undertaken a coordinated program of further analyses on the remains and investigation of the surrounding area. Excitingly, 2D and 3D facial reconstruction has been completed at Dundee, and Mark Hall will now tell you more about this project. Hello, Hello conference. conference. Thank, Thank you, Orshi and Kate. It's been great working with you on this project and seeing the different elements come together. I just want to take a minute of conference time to share this current version of the immersive facial reconstruction of the Blair Athol Pict we've been hearing about. The face is the work of Hayley Fisher and the underlying modeling and animation of the head has been added by Chris Rin. We're working with Chris to finalize the model for use in the archaeology gallery of the new museum for Perth set to open in a couple of years time. It will be one of several facial reconstructions that will form a key element of the interpretation in that new museum. I should say that this uh, is an abbreviated version that we did for Instagram release and that the final film uh, actually runs to three or four minutes. But I hope you enjoy it. And uh, back to you, Orshi. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. In addition to the facial reconstruction, Blair Atoman is now part of the ongoing Harvard Ancient People's DNA project and we are sure to learn a lot more about him in the coming years as a result. Today, we will focus on the research conducted at the University of Aberdeen, building on isotope analytical techniques. We wanted to know more about the diet of this individual, and for this purpose, we used stable carbon and nitrogen isotope analyses. In addition, using these methods, we can even learn about past people's mobility, building on strontium, oxygen, and sulfur isotopes. This individual is part of a major research effort that is reassessing Pictish diet and life ways, and Kate will now tell you more about this particular research. Thanks, Orshi. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Pictish diet and what we know so far. But first, I'm going to say a little bit about why we study food at all. Now, for archaeologists, food is fascinating. And this is because it's a biological necessity. Everybody has to eat but also because what we eat tells us so much about an individual and their place in society in the past. And of course, about society more generally. Food is a biological necessity, but it's also a cultural commodity. And food is multifaceted, and food itself plays a very important part of cultural expression. Now, when we consider foods, we don't just think about foods that were being consumed, but we think about all the aspects of the procurement of that food, its processing, its distribution, maybe things like trade, storage of food, preparation, consumption and disposal. And archaeologists use the term foodways to encompass all of these different steps. And because of this, because food has the potential to tell us so many different things about different parts of society, the reconstruction of past diets can tell us about past economies, social cultural practices and identities. So that is the individual's place 
within that society and their self-expression. With regards to what we know about medieval diet and early medieval diet specifically in Britain, most of the evidence we have comes from England. And there's actually quite a large amount of evidence from England. There is zooarchaeological evidence, so animal bones, and there's also quite a lot of isotopic data. And we'll tell you a little bit more about how that works in a minute. Now, both of these forms of evidence, at least from the English site, seems to tell us that in the early medieval period, diet was largely based on terrestrial food resources. Now, in Scotland, by comparison, we have until very recently had fairly limited evidence of Scottish early medieval diet, and especially in the northeast of Scotland. And of course, as you'll all know, the Pict is now a major um, archaeological research focus of the University of Aberdeen under various projects led by Gordon Noble. And as part of that, we've been very interested in looking at Pictish diet and the broader Pictish economy. And part of that has involved gaining more zooarchaeological evidence, so looking at the fauna remains that are attached to the various sites Gordon and his colleagues are investigating, but also beginning the generation of a large body of human and faunal isotopic data. So with regards to the faunal evidence, so this is the zooarchaeological evidence, um, what we know so far is that cattle seem to be very important, that they're um, representing normally uh, a high amount of bone at sites, but that we also find other species such as pig and uh, sheep or a goat. Now, what's different from the English record is that pigs seem to be more important relatively than sheep or goats, at least that's the story so far. I should say that this work is being led by Edward Masson McLean, who's a research assistant here in Aberdeen and works with Gordon on his comparative kingships project. So as well as these common domestic species, these herbivorous species and omnivorous species such as pigs, we've also been finding new evidence of species that weren't necessarily uh, represented before in the record, things like geese and ducks and chickens that have been found at Burghead and Mithatap. And because of the recovery techniques that are being used in the zooarchaeological investigation, so things like sieving, we're also finding things like fish remains. They're very rare, but we have found them at coastal sites, including salmon and cod at Burghead, and surprisingly, even fish remains at Mithatap, which is certainly not a coastal site, and as you can see, is also fairly high up, but we found a, a single salmonid bone there. I'll now hand over to Orshi, who's going to tell you a little bit about the methods that we use, the isotopic techniques, and how these can supplement and add to our picture of diet in the past. Thank you, Kate. Now, I hope you can see why we would be so interested to see what Pictish people would have eaten in the past. And of course, there's the zooarchaeological zoo methods that we can use to learn more about what kind of fauna was present at a site. But we can actually use methods that access this information directly from the skeletal remains. Thanks to developments in the field of isotopic science, we can access this direct information from the past. So let's discuss why we are what we eat, kind of. So the food and the water that we consume during our lives uh, has chemical traces that it leaves in our body. These are called isotopic signatures. They're specific signatures that can be detected in bones and teeth and even hair and fingernails. This helps archaeologists to identify the main types of food that one eats and the water they drink and even where they grew up or lived. This technique can be used to study the people of the past and a chemical analysis of the bones and teeth we find in the archaeological record can then give us valuable information about how people live. Isotopes are essentially different forms of the same chemical element. Some isotopes, like carbon and nitrogen, are useful in helping us reconstruct what the main components of past people's diet was, um, especially when they relied heavily on marine or terrestrial food sources, or to tell whether they ate mostly meat or vegetables. We analyze, for example, 
carbon and nitrogen isotope signatures that are present in preserved bone collagen or dentinal collagen. And this is a structural protein that is found in bone. And we can use these to determine the source of protein in the diet. We use dilute acid to release the protein its components and we can analyze uh, the protein. This, of course, happens in controlled conditions. But an uncontrolled way of extracting collagen would be, for example, um, creating a soup or broth that is cooked with bone um, that you can see going all wobbly once it's cooled down. And that is because of the uh, extraction of collagen. Now, we extract this protein in the laboratory from bones. This gives us a general picture of an individual's diet over the last few decades of their life. When trying to reconstruct diet of past people, it is necessary to create a baseline as well to which the results of the stable isotope analysis can be compared to. These will represent the local stable isotope values. As you can see, there is quite a nice distinction when it comes to herbivores, which have low stable carbon and nitrogen isotope values, omnivores, which are more enriched in comparison with the former, and then carnivores, um, and this is due to something called the trophic level effect. So basically, with each step of the food chain, we will see a significant increase in nitrogen isotope ratios and a much smaller one in carbon. This is why the aquatic fauna is so elevated in nitrogen 15. These are much lengthier food chains uh, than those found on land. In addition, carbon, val uh, carbon values are much higher in marine environments and as a result, we can tell marine animals apart very easily from terrestrial ones or even freshwater animals. This means that humans consuming a significant amount of marine food stuff would be quite distinct isotopically as well. So now the question is, where are Blair at all man fits within such a graph? As you can see, he displays very similar stable carbon and nitrogen isotope values to other previously published data. Uh, such as uh, the individuals from the first phase of Port Mahomac, from Westness and Kilfeather. Um, furthermore, based on the ongoing research that is addressing Pictish lives at the University of Aberdeen, we know that the diet of this individual was very similar to the majority of Pictish sites that we have studied, which includes over 50 individuals. It is notable, however, that these data differ from the contemporary English sites. And you will remember that Kate mentioned that actually the Zohar archaeological evidence is quite different from these sites as well. As you can see, the group that displays the most similarity with our Pictish samples are contemporary riverine sites, as they display evidence of elevated nitrogen 15 values, just as Blair at Oman, however, not quite so elevated uh, as our individual here. There seems to be no enrichment, in fact, in stable carbon isotope values of this individual, which indicates that there is no significant level of consumption of any marine food sources, which is perhaps not surprising. So we know that Pictish diet is actually remarkably homogeneous, with just a few individuals straying away from the pack and displaying more elevated values. Now, Blair et al. Man, however, is very similar to the majority of these other Pictish individuals with no evidence for the consumption of salmon or other marine food sources at all. Based on this data, actually, pork or wild boar and even perhaps freshwater species, including things like wildfowl, uh, may have been quite important sources of dietary protein for this individual in addition to low trophic level foods, of course, like herbivores such as cattle and sheep. Since the site is located at the confluence of the river Stilt and Gary, we know that there's potential for accessing sources of freshwater protein. Now, after talking about his diet, it is also important to consider other aspects of one's life. And Kate will talk to you about early medieval mobility and the Blair at Thanks, Orshi. So now we've learned a little bit about what isotopes can tell us about the diet of an individual in the past and what that can more broadly say about society in the past. I'm now going to focus on the other aspects of life that we can explore using isotopes, specifically mobility. Now, the reason why exploring personal mobility in this period is so interesting is because it is quite 
a historically elusive period. We don't know so much about it. And archaeological techniques, and specifically these kind of archaeological science techniques, can be very informative about revealing the life histories of individuals in the past. Now, understanding aspects such as lifetime mobility, and by that I mean comparing where someone was born and raised to where they eventually died, that can tell us about past cultural connections. And the political landscape we know at this time in this time period is very complex. And understanding individual lifetime movements can help us paint a broader picture of those cultural connections at that time and also, of course, past socio-cultural practices. So, for example, people use these techniques to look at um, movement practices with marriage, for example, in archaeology. Now, we have a limited amount of um, information about individual lifetime mobility in this time period. There have been some direct studies using isotopes. So, for example, at Kilfeda and at Port Mahomet, and they have given us some glimpses that we might have some fairly considerable personal mobility in this time period. So people um, being buried fairly far away from where they were born. But the evidence is, is small so far. Very few samples have been studied and definitely more studies are required. So these techniques, these techniques focus now on the mineral component of the skeleton rather than the collagen, the bone protein. And here we're looking at tooth enamel specifically. And we're interested in two different isotopes, oxygen and strontium. Now, as you can see from these two maps here, oxygen and strontium vary across landscapes. And we call these isoscapes. And if we can understand patterns of variation in oxygen and strontium across these landscapes, or if we can reconstruct these isoscapes, we can then analyze oxygen and strontium isotope ratios in dental enamel from individuals and place them upon these isoscapes. And because teeth form in childhood, they tell us about childhood location. So oxygen isotopes, these vary geographically broadly with climate. So the colder a place is, the lower your oxygen isotope values will be. So places like the Highlands in central Scotland, the Cairngorms, have some of the lowest oxygen isotope values in the UK. Now, these values influence the um, values of drinking water in those locations because this is all ultimately related to precipitation or rainfall. So you get these lower values in colder areas that then make the drinking water have those lower values, which are then passed on to individuals when they drink that water. And similarly, the warmer parts of the UK have higher values. And we see this in Scotland, unsurprisingly, on the milder west coast. Now, how strontium works, um, the sort of underlying variability is related to lithology. So the rocks beneath the ground that dictate the strontium isotope ratios of the soils, and then the plants that grow on those soils. There's a broad correlation with geological map in variation in strontium isotopes. So if we take these two systems, strontium and oxygen isotopes, we have two proxies that we can overlay that may help us identify place of origin for individuals. And as I said before, here we're generally focused on dental tissues because these form during childhood, so they can allow us to see how the place that somebody was born and raised differed from the place where we eventually find their burials. And also because dental enamel, unlike bone, is very resistant to what we call diagenetic change. Now that's change that would occur chemically in the archeological record after burial. And of course, we need to know that the signal that we're picking up is related to those in life, in vivo values, and of course, not contamination from the burial environment. It might not surprise you that, of course, if you do strontium isotope analysis on a tissue that's less resistant to diagenetic change, people mostly look like 
locals. So for example, if you analyze bone, nine times out of 10, it will be affected by diagenesis and thus you look like you have a local individual. But that's not really telling us anything about life in the past, that's just telling us about chemical contamination. So that's why we focus on the teeth. So we analyzed the second molar of Blair at all man, and this correlates with um, that period of time represented in the cusp of the second molar roughly correlates with mid to late childhood. So between the ages of about um, four or five and about seven or eight, and that's when that tooth mineralizes. Now, what was interesting is that that individual displayed quite elevated strontium isotope ratios, which differ from the local lithology. And these were coupled with quite high oxygen isotope ratios. So indicating an origin from a more milder location compared to the highland area that his burial was found. And for us, this implies a more westerly origin. And you can see on the map here that we've circled those potential locations that could correlate with those values. So perhaps the Isles of the Inner Hebrides and potentially areas even further afield, including maybe Ireland. So this is a very exciting discovery that here we have an individual buried at Blair Atoll, but who almost certainly spent their early years in a far more westerly region of Scotland or even further afield. So this is a very exciting discovery, evidence of the immigration of an individual from western to central Scotland in the age of St. Columba. And I have to say that this is an emerging pattern. I can't really go through the data with you, but we also have evidence of similar movements in burials we have at Cramond, which dates to the early medieval period, and also at one of the largest Pictish cemetery sites, London Links, where we have a number of individuals who seem to have originated from the West Coast. In fact, we've got a group of women who seem to come from the West Coast at that site who are all buried in the same complex. We call them the West Coast wifeys. And um, I'm very excited to see at the other sites that we're studying, whether we keep seeing this pattern and whether it prevails, and also whether there's anything else distinctive about the burials of the individuals who seem to be coming from the West Coast. And some of our colleagues in Aberdeen are using ancient DNA to explore that, to layer our evidence of origins, both in terms of personal mobility but also in terms of broader ancestry. So we've got a little bit more information now about personal mobility during this time period. And I think this is very exciting and will certainly lead to us learning a lot more about the dynamics of cultural connections and change in this period. I think it also highlights um, something we have to be careful of when we're looking at these different regions and trying to conflate a particular time and place with a particular culture because people move and um, and yeah I suppose this can uh, lead to us questioning um, our assignments of, of sites as one thing or another. Thank you Kate. As you can see we were able to learn a lot about this single individual using these isotopic techniques. We now know that the main food sources of Blairatolman were largely uh, terrestrial protein based, but because of the enrichment in nitrogen 15 but not in carbon 13, we also know that these food sources were rich in higher trophic level protein um, and there's evidence of the potential consumption of things like pork or freshwater protein uh, including riverine fish as well as waterfowl. Finally, this early medieval individual demonstrated evidence of early life mobility and possibly originated from westerly areas of Scotland or even further afield from places like Ireland. Through ongoing research, we began to see this emerging pattern of west-east movement in early medieval Scotland, but of course we clearly need more data before we can make any meaningful conclusions based on this. It is very rare that we get to learn so much about one person. On the scale of an individual's life, we learned about early connections 
between communities across Scotland in the first millennium, which were suggested by other archaeological, historical and even linguistic evidence. I hope we managed to show you how valuable individual life histories can be. Now, this is the work of many of us, and we are very thankful for all those who supported this research with their knowledge, expertise, and those who enabled the commencement of all these analyses in the first place. Thank you very much, and thank you all for listening.